This is Professor Stephen Schwiff of Columbia Gorge Community College discussing Virginia tobacco servants and slaves. Now we pick up this lecture a little bit after we left off Jamestown which was in the 1620s. During that time the colony of Virginia had been saved by the discovery of tobacco which grew very easily although was labor intensive. The crop allowed Virginia to make some money, buy goods that they weren't otherwise producing, and to encourage more and more settlement. Now this led to an expansion of the colony, mainly by people um, coming in, um, indentured servants that we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, some wealthy landowners or their children went over to America because land was plentiful and the um, very few people were there. So Virginia starts to grow. Well by 1640 the causes of death had diminished somewhat from cleaner water, um, longer um, existence in that area for allowing people to um, overcome the difficulties of living in Virginia. And so you start to have a natural increase in population from longevity in the 1640s, 50s, and so on. And we'll see the impact of that on the development of slavery, which is what this lecture is mainly about. Now by 1642, Governor Sir William Berkeley was in place in Virginia. And he was a court favorite of Charles I, who appointed him as governor. Um, he was mainly a farmer, um, well educated back in England. He was mainly a farmer, but he came over and saw the colony of Virginia as a miniature England, with him as a, at the top, like the King of England is at the top there, and his wealthy land owning elite, or what they called the Tidewater aristocracy, being his governor's council and his legislature with the House of Burgesses, the equivalent of the House of Commons back in England, um, being what the majority of people were elected to, although as we'll see in a subsequent lecture, the people being elected was still highly born, highly um, placed in society. Well, Berkeley um, left office in 1652 when King Charles I was executed during the Puritan Revolution, uh, but he returned shortly after Charles II had come back in with the rest restoration of the monarchy in 1660. So he was a very seasoned and long-term governor by the time we get to our main story in the, in the 1670s with Nathaniel Bacon. Now, the colonists all throughout this time had thrived on the growth of tobacco and the wealthier landowners were buying and acquiring more and more land. And this was allowed them to grow more tobacco, make more money and acquire more land and so forth. But tobacco was a year round endeavor and people who um, owned tobacco farms had to work um, on the tobacco all, all year round. And so um, very quickly it seemed that the wealthy landowners who didn't want to work that hard needed labor. And a single laborer who was working two or three acres could produce as much as 1,200 pounds of cured tobacco which would result in a 2,000 percent profit. And so tobacco production went way up during this time. Now the laborers at first were brought in as indentured servants. And this required a person who wanted to leave England and during this time you had some food shortages and, and some problems back in England. And so there were many, indent many people who had heard the stories and of course the settlers back, the settlers in Virginia had boistered their record and boistered their accomplishments as far as being a nice place to live in order to attract 
new settlers. And so people came over and they were promised 50 acres of land once they survived their indentured and some equipment, some clothes, things like that. Meanwhile, while they were working as indentured servants, they would be fed, clothed, and so forth by the, um, by the um, masters. Now these men, as one wrote in a letter home, were treated like damn slaves. And so there's very little distinction or difference between a white indentured servant and at this time black slaves. Now most, for the most part, the landowners were hiring indentured servants and they would come over um, in exchange for their boat ride, their ship ride to the New World, they would give up the next four to seven years as a servant. And so these contracts were held by the ship owner until he got to the New World where he would sell them off to the planters and that's how he paid for their voyage, paid for the, sh for the shipping of, of these people. Now you can very much imagine, as we'll talk about in the um, subsequent lectures about slavery, that they were in much better accommodations than slaves who were held very tightly and were in terrible, horrific conditions in what um, became known as a middle passage. Well, these indentured servants, for the most part up until 1640, did not live long, like I just mentioned. For the most part, they died within two or three, four years of their indentured servitude. So the people bringing them over and, and the people buying their contracts would receive not only um, their um, freedom from that contract, but they would receive the land that was promised to the indentured servants. So very quickly, um, these landowners got additional land. Now, meanwhile, they, the rich landowners were dying at a similar rate. And so there's very little um, cohesion as far as property rights passing on to the sons because many people were left without heirs. Now by 1640 that changed. More and more people were living longer, more and more of the indentured servants reached the end of their indentured servitude and lived a nice long life after that. And if they did, if they finished their seven years of indentured servitude, they would get the land, the property, everything that was promised to them. So this created a two-tiered system where the wealthy were very rich, um, had land that they could um, use for tobacco, but also leave fallow so that it would renew itself and create a future area for growth. While the small farmer who received a small piece of land um, had to work that land basically um, to death and eventually the land would be useless to those farmers. Well, why wasn't slavery an option up until this point? Mainly economic. The indentured service contracts cost about half of what bringing an African slave over cost. And slavery was rampant during this time in other parts of the British colonies, mainly um, the islands, the Sugar Islands, um, Barbados, places like that that we're not going to discuss um, in very much detail in this class at all. So slavery was being um, used in various parts, but economically it was cheaper to bring in poor Englishmen who would work as indentured servants, usually die before their time was out. Well, that changed again in 1640. African Americans who were brought over as slaves um, started living longer too. So the cost of a slave, which was twice as much as a white indentured servant, um, would be justified with the longer lives of the African slaves. So um, this creates the conditions um, for the slave-based, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the race-based slavery. Well, by 1670s, you had white and black servants and slaves working together, being treated pretty much the same. Um, we'll see some of the laws that develop um, over the time in a few minutes, but there was very little difference between anyone who was not, who was treated, who was a slave or a servant. People were intermarrying. Um, some of the black um, servants or slaves 
were freed after a period of time, just like their white counterpoints. And there are a few black plantation owners who own other slaves, own other black um, slaves. And so the system um, is working and it's not totally race-based. Well, by the 1670s, it's economically becoming um, unfeasible for the colony to continue having as many free white farmers and the few blacks that I mentioned um, in the colony. And so there's pressure. There's pressure for land. And in this pressure comes Nathaniel Bacon. Now, Bacon is the son of a rich landowner in England, but he was the third son, and the first, as we'll see in the family lecture, the first son would inherit the property and the, um, and the na family name, family estate. The second son would usually get some kind of role in government or religion to take care of them, and often the third son would get some property, some um, efforts to help them set up their lives, but were generally left on their own devices. Well, Bacon was a very um, irresistible type of person. It was hard to deal with. His, when he um, married, the, his father-in-law refused to have any um, contact with either him or his um, daughter, with Bacon or his, um, his wife. Um, that was the type of person Bacon was. And his father, in order to get rid of him, bought him an estate in the New World. And so Nathaniel Bacon comes over, not as an indentured servant, which roughly 70% of all the whites in the colonies had come over originally as indentured servant, but he comes over as a landowner. Well, he immediately, immediately feels the tension, wants more land, and part of the tension was directed towards the Native Americans. The planters wanted to move the Indians off their land, and this would allow them to expand their estates because they could move into Indian lands as their own. But the governor, Berkeley, refused to allow them to attack the Indians. The natives were first friendly, at least most of them, and second, he didn't want to antagonize the unfriendly natives to go to war. Um, he was certainly aware of the King Philip's War in, um, no in the north in New England that claimed several thousand lives and did not want a repeat in his Virginia. Well, Bacon wasn't concerned with this. He raised an army of 500 people. He attacks um, the um, natives, um, some of them peaceful, some of them were not but he wipes them all out regardless of their affiliation and he marches on Jamestown and he confronts Governor William Berkeley. Now ironically Berkeley and Bacon were related um, through marriage but they were cousins but this confrontation forced Berkeley to give in and he allowed a free election, he allowed Bacon onto the into the House of Burgesses, well, where Bacon actually passed several pro-democratic, pro-poor um, legislation, and Berkeley allowed Bacon's army to continue to attack the natives and to free up the land. Well, as soon as Bacon left on this ex exploration towards the natives, Berkeley denounced him, called him a traitor, canceled most of his legislative reforms, and went out onto a British warship and called for reinforcements back from London. The situation had grown very dangerous and volatile, and many historians wonder what would have happened next. Would Bacon and his followers have been able to throw, overthrow the government? Some trace back our revolutionary roots to Bacon's Rebellion, and in fact, some of, the colon some of the founding fathers also looked back and thought that this was the seed that eventually they would cultivate into the American Revolution. 
But something unexpected happens. And as we've talked about many times, um, history is the story of men, and it, it turns on unexpected things. And Bacon dies of dysentery. Without his leadership, his movement falls apart. Berkeley comes back with the British reinforcements, attacks Bacon's followers, and he wipes out hundreds of um, hundreds of followers, including white and black servants. But the larger story forced Berkeley and the Virginians to change the basic structure of Virginia. Now, Berkeley himself would return to England disgraced and be replaced by another governor, but the Virginians quickly figured out that they had to do something about these um, growing white, poor farming class. And so they started to look towards slavery as the answer to the labor pro problem. Now, several things had developed during this time. First, as we've mentioned several times, the population growth. And the fact that people were living longer and surviving their initial encounters in the New World allowed the slavery, the economics of slavery, to outweigh the economics of indentured servitude. In other words, you could buy a slave for life for twice of what you could buy a indentured servant now for seven years. And you wouldn't have to give the slave any land or any rights. And so quickly, slavery started to outlast or outnumber um, white servants. Second, in the 1660s and 70s, the British took over the slave trade from various sources and they put it as a monopoly and it became more effective. So slaves were more available at this time as well. Third, you have the middle colonies developing, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and check the um, lecture on those colonies for more information. And they were attracting more and more of the white settlers who had a choice. If you had a choice coming over to the New World, you could settle in these, you would have religious freedom, you would have more political freedoms, and better climate than in Virginia, or for that matter, in New England. And so you ended up having more and more white settlers who would have been the indentured servants moving to those middle colonies rather than coming to Virginia or um, Massachusetts. So now you can have more slaves and you can see a change in society. Now the other factor is slaves would not merge into um, society. They couldn't escape very easily because of their race. You could tell a black person from a white person. And so as slavery develops as a race-based system, you had the security that you could enforce laws against the freedoms of black people um, rather than a select group of white people. And so very quickly you have the whites being elevated, the poor whites are elevated over their black fellow servants. And we'll see this as we go through the laws in just a second. And so couples that would have married were discouraged. Um, couples or people who worked together or would have, um, would have lived with um, each other, whites and blacks, servants and slaves, um, start to separate. Now let's look at these laws. We can see that as the House of Burgesses um, starts wrestling with the issues of race and slavery, that very quickly it becomes based on race. And the whites, once again, are elevated and the blacks are subjugated. Um, also, as we go through these laws, let's consider why laws are passed. Um, despite all the future science, um, science fiction um, books and movies, we have no speed limits on our um, jetpacks yet. 
And I'm, I'm joking, of course, because jetpack technology has not replaced the automobile. So you only pass laws for things that you want to regulate that are actually at risk. Therefore, we have driving speed limits um, to protect our society. So as we look at these, we'll see that very real risks are being addressed. So the first one, 1662. Um, children born to Negro women were free or bonded according to the condition of the mother. And we'll see this when we talk about families in Virginia and, um, and um, the, new world, the new world, that without reference to marriage and to um, control of, of women's sexuality, you're unable to tell whose child a woman is bearing. And so to protect themselves from claims of freedom by every slave child, they based it on the condition of the mother. Now, this would also lead to a lot of half white, half um, master, for the most part, um, children and half slave children um, being held as slaves. And this will create quite the controversy, not only in history, with such figures as Thomas Jefferson being um, alleged to have had many slave children, but throughout the South, where one slave um, wife, a white wife, said that um, the mulattoes, which is a term at the time for mixed race children, um, were as plentiful as the blueberries, and that each family had the white children and the black children looking very much like the master's um, faces, and this was one of the, um, the untold secrets of slavery, and we'll get into this in much de more detail um, as we talk about slavery throughout the semester. So in 1667, the baptism of slaves as Christians did not alter, alter their status as slaves. Now once again, this is an interesting one because slaves must have been converting to Christianity where the basic tenet of the religion is that you can't hold your fellow Christians as slaves. Um, and they were overturning this biblical accepted law. And so they wanted to keep the slaves as slaves, even if they became Christian. And for the most part, um, African Americans were, um, or Africans at the time, were mostly Muslim. And there was large uh, Muslim kingdoms, especially in West Africa, where many of the slaves that came to America were captive. In 1669, a master who di killed a disobedient slave could not be accused of a felony. Again, this is producing an environment in the South where slaves had to listen to their masters, had to obey the commandments of their masters, or they could be killed without punishment to the master. I mean, for the most part, our morality in this country keeps us from killing others. But the, also, there's a strong um, disincentive to kill people based on the death penalty or at least a long imprisonment for the crime of murder. Well, that was removed from the white masters, and now they could punish their slaves even to death. And as you can imagine, this placed African Americans in a very difficult situation if they were going to either fight for their freedom or try to run away for their freedom. In 1670, free Negroes and Indians were prohibited from buying Christian indentured servants. This law implies that that, that, that was happening, that free blacks or Indians were buying, were receiving indentured servants um, either from their masters in the New World or from the ships bringing them over. And so you can imagine this was a little bit upside down from what the Virginians wanted to be the rule, which was black slaves, white, free people. And so they prohibited. 
but it must have been at least a risk of happening, if not actually happening, um, throughout this time. And like I mentioned, we do know of, of blacks, free blacks, owning slaves themselves, black slaves. I'm not sure if we have reports of um, them owning white indentured servants. But at least it was a risk enough that they would create this law. Now from 1670 to 1680, you have Bacon's Rebellion. And so notice how the laws change. You already have the development of a race-based slavery before Bacon's Rebellion. But then these laws are going to be even more, even more restrictive and even harsher on black slaves. So in 1680, slaves are prohibited from carrying weapons and leaving their owner's plantation without a pass. So before, when a, a free black might be left to have his own farm, you couldn't restrict his um, ownership of a weapon. Um, if you had uh, Native Americans around, if you had wild animals that might attack you, you had to be have a weapon. Well, now slaves were take that right was taken away from them, and so now they are so totally subjected to the whites' control, since white men are going to have guns and going to be able to um, treat the slave however they want. If they tell them to do something and they refuse to, they can threaten them with violence with their guns. And you know, a white person's word was going to count a lot more than a black person's word. In fact, um, as laws continue to be passed, you're not going to allow the Virginia and the other states are not going to allow um, African American testimony well in, until well until the 20th century. 1682, no master or overseer could permit a slave to remain on his plantation for more than four hours without the permission of the slave's owner. So this combined with the um, fact that you needed a pass to leave your, your own plantation put southern blacks in a type of southern jail. You had to have permission, you had to have proof that you could travel. And any white man was the jailer. They had weapons, they had the permission, the, the right to ask any black person they saw, let me see your papers, let me see proof that you can be out here um, riding around, walking around, um, being away from any plantation. And if you spent too long on another person's plantation, you were um, sent home after this four hour period. And so runaways would not have other plantations to um, slaves to help them run away. They couldn't hide uh, another plantation's slaves. Now in 1691, you start to see how the separation of, between the races is, um, that line is being firmly drawn. So in, 17, in 1691, any white man or woman who marries a Negro, mulatto, and as I explained, that was a person with mixed blood, or Indian was banished from Virginia. So in 1691, if you were white and you married um, one of these minority groups, you had to leave the colony. So it's in your best interest as a white person to separate yourself from African Americans. Now there's um, very little records of anybody being forced to leave Virginia under this law, but it does separate the races firmly and finally, that if you're white, you're going to see your future with the other whites, even if they're your economic superiors, rather than the blacks who are going to be held as slaves and be slaves for life. In 1705, um, all servants, not Christian, in their native countries <coughs> and reported to Virginia were slaves. And slaves remained slaves even if they traveled to England. So this finally establishes black slavery for life. That any servant that was not Christian in their native country, so any servant who wasn't a white British servant, was going to be held as a slave. 
and this finally sets in stone the race-based system of slavery. Now part of this leads to the belief in Virginia and other parts of the country that all whites have a future, have a, have a united future or a similar future. That all whites are leased, no matter how poor you are, and there are very many poor white farmers who are barely scraping by. But no matter how poor you are, if you're white, you're free. And this is distinguished because there's a whole race of people, um, African Americans, that are not free, that are slaves. And so when we get to the words of Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder his entire life, a major slaveholder for his adult life, the words that all men are created equal, and in that they are guaranteed their liberty, he was clearly talking about all white men. And that was the belief that came out of Virginia, that was spread throughout the country, that was created or allowed to be created from this slave system that's developed in Virginia. Now, at this point, I would recommend a couple of different sources on slavery. The first is a video called Making of America Slavery, and what we've talked about um, is discussed in the first part where they trace the slavery developing in New Amsterdam and also throughout the colonies they do mention some of the things in Virginia just very briefly but they also go on to talk about South Carolina in the first and only violent slave rebellion during the colony during the colonial period so I'd recommend watching that also much of the um, the um, information I gave you um, in this lecture comes from Edmund Morgan's book, American Freedom, American Slavery. So I would recommend that book as a very good source for life on Virginia, the development of indentured servitude and slavery in that colony.